time to strap in and get ready. The leaders in NRL Supercoach are incoming. Bringing you the ultimate insight to help you win your leagues and climb up the rankings. You're now listening to the Insight NRL Show with your hosts, Brain, Matrix, and Whisperer. Hello and welcome to the Insight Fantasy Sports Podcast. This is a little Q&A episode. It's brought to you today by the Standard Squeeze, Insight Unlimited, and Ryan from Astute Newstead. Whisperer, how are you, mate? You enjoying I'm, your Wednesday night? I see you've got oh, some Maccas. I do have some Maccas. Got a couple of cheeky nugs, mate. It's been a long week. We had, the, we had the recap on Monday. We had the long podcast last night. I just finished up recording my other side project, the NRL Super Fantasy Coach podcast, which is just a collaboration of fantasy and Super Coach together. Uh, and then we're doing this. So um, talking about the same topics for four days in a row is always fun. But the Q&A is important. Uh, obviously exclusive to our Discord unlimited members. $25 for the year that gets you access to not only NRL, but also AFL, NBL, BBL giving you the best insight to take out the Supercoach World Cup hosted by Insight Fantasy Sports. But we are here today to answer some of those burning questions because it's a pretty big week, Matrix. It's a huge week, and that's why we've had such long episodes this week, um, just because there's so much to cover. Um, you know, there's some, there's some low break evens. There's some guys that um, obviously there's a lot of questions coming up as to who is must have and who you must get. Um, you know, both the two best halfbacks in the week, uh, in the league not playing this week is a um, yeah is a bit of a tricky one. So yeah, we'll answer all these. Do you want to do you just dive into some of these questions, mate? Let's rip off the lid. Let's get straight in. Let's do it because I've got a couple um, that center around um, Olam and Bostock. Um, and I know you're a Tigers fan, so don't let that bias creep in here, my friend. Um, but Bray Triple Eight is asking: Is it too late on Bostock? And in a secondary tr- question, is Olam a genuine option for those wanting to make cash? I don't think it's too late on boss. Like, let's have a look at the draw. We've obviously got the Tigers this week. Pretty tough matchup against the Broncos next week. Away into Parramatta, Newcastle, Cowboys, Manly, Tigers, and then the Warriors away. Don't think it's a we're missing boss doc. But, I mean, obviously the, the best time was to buy it before. But still sitting with a minus 41 break even is a touch over 400k now. Still cash to be made in a very attacking team. doesn't really matter about points conceded for the Dolphins. They're getting in and around that attack. Uh, it's just you'd, a little bit more than what you wanted to pay, but I don't think it's too late for Bostock at all. As for Justin Ollum, man, he had never averaged... Like, he's had one season above 60 average, and that was in a very crash-hot Melbourne Storm side. So I'm just not seeing the appeal. I understand that he's now a strike weapon for us, and we're using him accordingly. But, like, it's just... it's. It screams of Zach Hosking from a couple of weeks ago, but the break even isn't as good as what Hosking's was. Hosking's was like a minus 85, whereas Olam's is only a minus 40. It's still good cash to be made, but if you jumped on Hosking and then jumped off, I probably wouldn't jump on Olam just because then that's what four trades you've had to to bomb for, you know, probably not 400k price rises. Yeah, no, I I agree with you there, mate. Um, which leads into some other questions from Dr. Hammer and Jack Dem. Um, and I'll grab the Hammer one. He's asking, is Olam or Bostock a better play? And I think, like, having a look at that draw that you brought up earlier, um, you know, attacking the Dolphins definitely was a play from a couple weeks ago, uh, but with a negative 40 break even um, and him being still cheaper than Olam, I really can't see you know what? You want to really be attacking at making some money because Olin will make some money. It's a negative 40 break even. Um, by all means, get them both. But for me, Bostock is a bigger priority. And I already have Bostock, um, but I don't find myself bringing Olam in this week, which is probably the answer. No, just because Olam has got a 15 in him just as much as what he has an 80. And so does Bostock, but I just think Bostock's yes. draw is slightly better. Uh, in a, probably just a more potent attacking team. I don't think the Dolphins are better, but I think they're more attacking, which, you know, bodes well for your centre wings. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that one answers that for Hamo. And um, Jack Dem's asking, um, look, we've both said that we really like Bostock this week, um, but Jack Dem's asking, is that worth a boost, Whisper? 
probably not. Like one of the main moves is, is Talagi, obviously, and then whatever you're doing with your second move. I don't know if I'd be boosting for Bostock. Like he seems like a, a candidate that's perfectly fine for your second trade, but not. A third. I, I mean, I've also been pretty risky with my boost, so take what I say with a pinch of salt. But I just think if you're not getting any kind of keepers in, which I doubt you would be with Bostop because he's already 400k, it's not like you're downgrading massively. Um, unless you're bringing in like two keepers in a Bostock, then it's probably not worth a boost for for mine. Like I don't think I don't think he's a must-have, but he's definitely a great option. I like that. And while we're on the question of boosts, uh, Mr. Callio, a uh, friend and fan of the show, um, obviously, um, is it worth a boost to bring in Talagi? Um, yes. Yeah, I definitely 100% think so. But in all my trades, he's one of the first I do. So I get Talagi in, and then I find what I'm doing with the extra cash. Yeah, like, yeah. I wonder, like, if Talagi's your last trade, um, what are you doing with those other trades? Like maybe you need to have a bit of a harder look at like those sideways trades. Obviously they're sideways cash dependent. Maybe they're not sideways talent wise, but Talagi should be the first one you bring in. And then you've got this big pool of cash and you should be working out how to distribute that cash after that. Would you agree with me there? Yeah. So the first thing that you'd be doing is trading out Salmon, Burbo, Satili, Whoever is your maxed out cash cow that you've, you're moving on from, you bring to luggy in. Like, that's a mandatory move. And then that frees you up, you know, 150, 200K. And then from there, you start looking at, all right, well, what's the difference between a deal bags to a Val Holmes? Or, a, you know, if we do go Heinz to SJ, we've got now like 400K in the bank. And then we can go, a, you know, a Salmon to a Dom Young. Like, that's where the boost comes in for me. And, and that's where I'm saying yes to. Like, I'm, if you're sitting there going, like, oh, we'll do, you know, um, deal bags to to Dom Young, and then we'll do something else. We'll do like a Statili to a Crichton, and then we're boosting for for like we're just boosting to bring Talagi in. Like no, I think he's a priority, but then that obviously takes up half of your available trades this week. So then if you're boosting to to make that you know thirty three percent, that's where it is more valuable for me. I still think I still think it's probably boost worthy, but you probably have to have plans in place for what you're going to spend that cash on next week. Um, like, yeah, you, you know, probably at least making a hundred K out of this. Um, yes, it banks it up. Look, I would rather play Talagi than a, than a Burbo or, or someone like that anyway. And Talagi's going to get a fairly decent price rise this week. Uh, minus 55 break even, um, could go really well against Canberra as well. Could get 50. Um, yeah, I still think it's a boost for Talagi. Yeah, m- minus 55 break-even, which some people that maybe aren't familiar with break-evens out there are saying, like, why do we think Talagi is such a must-have out of minus 55 when Bostock's only, like, a good buy at 41? And it's because Talagi's so cheap that his break-even next week, the week after, and the week after that is going to be so low. Like, we saw that with Ben Travojevic, who started much more expensive. He started at 270k. He had one good score of 70 and then another score of 50. And his break even was still, like, minus 100 the next week. So because, of, like, the cheaper they are, the lower the break-even is going to be. And that's why we have Talagi on such a high pedestal. And if it is his spot to hold for, you know, eight to 10 weeks, yeah, we're probably not going to own him for that long. We'll probably flick him after six weeks or so. Um, but if he's pumping you at 45, then there's an easy 200, 250K that we can make on him. Whereas Bostock, we would need him to get to a 600K to have the same value where I don't think he gets that high. I don't ever see, like, boss. that would be Bostock being Herbie Farnworth money. And I don't mm. really ever see that happening. Yeah, for Bostock to make the same money as like Talagi, which is 200k, he would have to have like probably two to three 90s in his next six weeks. Um, whereas Talagi only needs to have like a, a 70 and a couple of 60s to, to really get that generation in, in up in the 250k range. Yep. Um, let's go into Bobby Boucher. Fantastic name, um, but he's already Whoa. calling is already calling this one the question of the week. Um are we holding Heinz and Cleary and taking an AE? Um, I'll let you grab this one first. And yeah, I, I know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. So um, yeah, talk us through it. Yeah. And uh, Bobby Boucher would know what I'm doing. Being an inside unlimited member, I've made my trades pretty clear in there. But I'm looking at my bench and I've got one, two, three players that, aren't play- that are playing this week. So I've only got three guys that are going to really stuff up my AE. So I'm pretty fortunate that I'm not going to be shafted too much when it does come to my AE. 
Um, but I am holding because I do think Hines and Cleary are just so much better than the rest. And I don't think – I think – and I, I had this bet with you guys um, last night. I think someone like a Sam Hughes this week and then five weeks of Hines is better than six weeks of SJ. Uh, and that's just the way that I'm looking at it. Yeah, it might be a small hit this week, but for long-term – um, gains and by holding clear in Hines, it, l- it allows me to be a little bit more aggressive with my trades this week as, as what you and Brain have seen when we've discussed them in sort of the group chat. So holding those guys allows for a little bit more, uh, I don't know if recklessness is the right word, but much uh, more, more aggressive moves with your trades. Yeah. And I'm full disclosure, I'm holding Hines and, and Cleary as well. Um, I- Copying the AE, I have Burbo, Salmon, and, and Hughes as my AEs. Um, I'm thinking with Sam Hughes starting, I would love to think that maybe all those guys can hit 30 this week, um, which, you know what, in other weeks I've played guys um, that got 30. So, um, yeah, you win some, you lose more. Uh, but Hines going down to SJ when you have a look at SJ's draw over the next couple of weeks, when you have a look at Luke Metcalf coming out of the team, when you talk about SJ grabbing that goal kicking, um, was a pretty big, big decision um, to not go with. Um, look, SJ's vibes. Um, oh, yeah, we're, the not saying, we're not saying SJ's bad. It's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I, well, like, we know what Hines is. Like, historically, Hines is what he is, and he might be a small hit on what he once was. Um, but I think a lot of things have to go right for SJ to, to match Hines. And then it's a case of, like, do we want to be gambling on a lot of what-ifs? when we can just take what we already know. And that was the only decision for me and, yeah. and yourself. A hundred percent. And and that's the way that I'm going. I just want to give people an alternative route, I suppose, um, to playing an AE. I don't think I've ever in the halves copped an AE. Um, so I'm a bit scared of this one. But yeah, I just... yeah, I'm, oh, so I'm The, the worst time for clear to go down because, yeah, Heinz has the, the buys. So it's like the two clear-cut options are both out in the same week, which is not ideal. Yeah. And I think now the way that SJ's draw opens up with Luke Metcalf going down. Everyone knows I'm a Metcalf believer. I can't believe I'm still talking about him. But um, I think SJ just jumps Jerome Hughes for me. Jerome Hughes is the other one now that he's finished with his uh, with his buy that you could go for a couple of weeks and then go back to Hines. But you really want to have already saved some trades at this point yeah. if you're going to get those guys in just to get them back. Um, yeah, look, it's it's a no from me, but if you were, it's probably SJ or Hughes or absolutely nothing. I don't go with any of this Drew Hutchinson at halfback or anything. Um, he could score less than Burbo, Salmon, and Sam Hughes this week. So, yeah, it's a no from me. Yeah, and we don't want to be it. hindsight heroes, but, like, we never liked Brooks. Like, I know we flowed with the idea, but, like, we never liked him as a replacement for S- for, for Hines or Cleary. And, um, unfortunately, it didn't work out for owners that jumped on. But it's like, don't take a hit. Like, we say it all the time when coaches make decisions about changing in field. Don't str- don't weaken one position to not strengthen the other. And that's what I felt like people were doing when it came to taking it a halfback. SJ goal kicking came at the perfect time because that was a, a viable option. There's probably only, I would say, four <coughs> viable options at halfback at the moment with DCE not playing great. It would be yeah, Cleary, Hines, and, and then SJ and and. Uh, Hughes, which are a clear tier below. And like, I know that there's no questions about Brooks coming in, but Brooks at five eighths is a better pill to swallow yeah, for than, me than, than Brooks at halfback. Yeah. hundred percent. Because he just doesn't compete uh, with even the guys on tier two in, in Hughes and um, SJ. Yep. Um, Diddley with an exclamation mark. Um, who to bring in for turbo. So he's looking at swapping turbo out this week. Um, yep. He's looking at Pappy, Drinkwater, Gutherson, and Tedesco. Um, your thoughts? Lot to unpack here. So the thing for me that sticks out, KP's draw, um, obviously plays St. George this week versus next week, and then it really opens up nicely for him, uh, as we can see there in that Knights column. Don't rule out Reese Walsh either. Like I know that Turbo plays Manly this week and it's, uh, Turbo plays Penrith this week. It's not great, but that Broncos draw gets really juicy from round seven to, uh, sorry, even round six. I mean, the Dolphins into the Raiders, into the Tigers, Roosters, Parramatta, Manly, into Gold Coast before Origin. Roosters, Teddy's good and he'll have his weeks. He has a floor of about 50, which is really nice on the bad weeks. You know what you're going to get from Tedesco. The draw is just really all over the place. Um, Melbourne next week, Newcastle away this week in the torrential rain. 
Broncos and then New Zealand in, in a couple of weeks as well. We know New Zealand do concede points to to fullbacks, but it's not a, an amazing matchup. Very up and down all over the place. Drinky's draw is, is quite good. Does play Penrith at home, which is probably the place to play them in round eight, as we can see there from the Cowboys draw. And then there was one more person, uh, Pappenhausen and Gutho. Yep. So Pappy's draw, yep, not great this week. Broncos at home, but if there was a time to play the Broncos, it's probably now, uh, especially at home when you do get Munster back and then it gets really juicy from there. Roosters, Souths, Titans, Sharks, Parramatta, uh, Manly as well. Like that's a, a really nice run for Pappy. We wish he was goal kicking because he would be pretty much a must have. Uh, and that's what brings Clint Gutherson into the conversation. Uh, really nice draw for Gutho too. Cowboys at home, Dolphins away, Manly. Bye into the Broncos, into Melbourne. That's probably the big slide on, Guth- on Gutho. He's got two really tough fixtures and a bye and then takes on Souths as well. But Gutho, obviously all effort player, loves to get involved. If I had to rank them, uh, if we can get that question back up, I'd probably rank them Paps, Drink, Gutho, Teddy. Yep. I actually you? think Drink, Water, if you're attacking matchups, could nearly be the best one out of all of them. Um, but just after last week, it Still getting 70 in that. I think Drinkwater is probably the best player out of them. But I think when you go Pappy and Gutho, there's also the opportunity to make a little bit of money. That's so exactly probably, the thing because Paps and yeah. Gutho, Gutho is 707 and Paps is 690 compared to a drinky at, say, 825. 825. And we had this discussion last night. Like, do we think certain players are 13, 14 points better, even though they might be the best player? Drinky might only get you four or five more points per game on average, and it's just not worth the money you're paying. So I think for value, for me, it's Paps. Um, and then probably Drink just based off production. Then Gutho, because he's still quite cheap. And then Teddy, just I just don't trust the draw. But he, Teddy has the, probably the second best floor behind Gutho. Yeah, I'm a bit scared watching Paps play against the Broncos on both steads because, yeah. you know, the Broncos could absolutely turn up and, you know, Pappy doesn't, doesn't deliver or... Um, Pappy could absolutely run riot. I just think Gutho with the goal kicking with Parramatta scoring output, Gutho just jumps Pappy for me. But drink water if you're just looking at getting points on the board. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can make money and score well out of Paps and Gutho. Yeah, sweet. Um, Bray, uh, Triple Eight back again. Are Turbo and Trail genuine trade out options giving the form? and draw of guys like Gutho, Ponga, and KP. Um, who would you trade out of Turbo or Trell? Need to get the cash to bring in Cleary in a couple of weeks. I think that the question cut off there. Yep. And this was the problem with trading out Cleary, is then you're now having to make multiple sacrifices to bring him back in. For me, it depends how aggressive you want to be. The most sensible option is to trade out Trell out of those two, because you're going to have to trade out Trell anyway. We look at the draw again, if we can remove that question. Uh, we look at Manly's draw, not great. Penrith at home, Warriors away. Probably two of the toughest matchups you could probably get. Um, and then plays the Titans, which is one of the best you can get. So if you want to get really creative and you really love to have Turbo in your team, you could trade him out this week, hold Trell, get your long-term other fullback, and then bring Turbo back in in round seven. That is something that I'm looking at doing. I'm also, if Manly don't look good, uh, I don't hate the Knights draw as well. Like the Knights playing the Bulldogs, the Dolphins. That's also handy in six and seven. And we keep going back to Reese Walsh. He's a guy that, you know, is terrifying to watch. Me personally, uh, if I had to pick between Trell and Turbo, I think based off draw, I'm trading out Turbo. He's also 70K more expensive as well. Souths do have a nice matchup in uh, New Zealand at home, which is much better than away. We know New Zealand do like points and Trell plays quite well at a core stadium. Also has the goal kicking to boost that floor. Trell, Scored 69 points last week with only one line break assist. So 61 points there for him just doing absolutely sweet FA. Look at Turbo. Had to have that try assist, line break assist just to get to 55 last week in a matchup we thought he was going to dominate. The smart play is the, probably the more sensible play is to trade out Trell and hold Turbo because you want him long term. But if you're a little bit of a risk taker, I think trading out Trell, a Turbo this week, holding Trell and then trading Trell in round seven to whatever other fullback you desire. Yep, and we've gone through all those other fullbacks anyway. Um, I probably sit on the trading out trail option. Um, I just think Turbo, even with all those mistakes last week, Manly could have absolutely turned it on. Uh, whereas Trail to me looks 
disinterested, um, as I've sort of said all along, and um, just watching him live, that that hands-on hips, that that walking around in back play. I know he's done that his whole career, and he's probably nearly touched a million dollars in Supercoach at times. But, yeah, for me, um, yeah, I'd be keeping keeping Turbo because I don't want to burn too many trades at, at, uh, at fullback, especially when there's so many gun options. Like, if you can sit there and get on an excellent run of, say, a Turbo and a, uh, and a KP, I'd be loving to do it. So You'd need to get the rest of your team pretty much set because if you're going to be just be burning trades at fullback, then you're going to be losing them out at other places, which is fine. You just want to have more of a set core. Yep. Um, would you go... Sorry, I accidentally didn't load this one up. Uh, Dr. Hamo's asking, of course, uh, from Hamo's Home Finance. Um, if you had to choose, and I think I know the answer here, but maybe it's a discussion about the other ones. He's asking between Lomax, Manu, or Pappy, as he's 1K short of Gutho. Um, I know you're probably going to say uh, Pappy, but out of Lomax and Manu, who would you rank the second one then? I, if it wasn't for one matchup, I'd be buying Manu this week. I'm I'm actually really keen on Manu. It's just he plays Stephen Crichton this week. He was probably the toughest defensive center matchup that you're going to get in the comp. In saying that, Jack Whiten also did score two tries on him last week. So it's not, um, no, actually, no, he didn't because he's a right-hand setter. My apology. Yeah. Um, yeah, left-hand Bulldogs defense is not fun. So if you're a right side of center, it's not a great time to, to be matching up on Tracy and Manu. Um, Manu. Tracy and Crichton. I really like Manu. I think if you can look past this week, I love him because he's going to be a long-term keeper. You're going to get those massive 110, 120-point scores during Origin when Tedesco's out. He'll pick up the jewel, which is really handy. I, I love him. I'm not too sure. I mean, Lomax, yes, he's looked good this year despite everything going on around him. But now the fact that this news has come out in the media about him getting his release, it's just more variables to add. Look, Lomax could be a consummate professional and not let this affect him. But what if it does? It's not like yeah. we're buying Lomax at 400K to take a punt. We're paying nearly top dollar for him. I, he's, he's got a better floor, but there's just too much head noise for me to, to buy Lomax. Yep, and, I agree. And just yeah. before you go on, like he could be on a new club at any week. Like the Dragons yeah. have said, yes, you can leave at 2025. But the option for him to leave is still there now if they get a good deal. So there's no guarantee that he's anywhere. Like, not that it happened, but what if he just, what if you paid 680K for him and he just ended up at the Titans? Not that that's probably going to happen, but what if it does? And you're sort of screwed there. So I'd rather just take Manu. We know that he's gone this year, but it's Manu. He's staying at the Roosters, a better attacking team. Yep. No, but I agree. Yeah. Um, I'm not yeah, going After all that, Pappy. Back. Yeah, the answer's Pappy. Um, yeah, we knew that. We were talking about Pappy as one of the best fullbacks. Um, yeah, of course, when you start bringing in these centers. Um, but Manu is a guy that I'm probably looking at through origin due to his uh, little Kiwi accent. Um, second solution, um, currently has Galvin and Strange at 5'8". Um, with Galvin out, he can either, one, just roll with Strange. Two, uh, move to a picky, move Strange down, add Brooks. Or cut to a peaky, move strange, and try for another 5 8th. Who would the other 5 8th be if not for Brooks? So, not, not ideal um, because Galvin's going to walk straight back into Penrith Broncos, which is not fun. Um, but Ethan Strange this week plays the Parramatta Eels at home. Nice little matchup there for him. And then he walks into the Titans at home as well. So if there was a two-week play for him to run as your 5'8", then I think it's fine. Plays the Broncos away, which isn't great. So you might just be taking a hit at 5'8". But who knows? Maybe, you know, one of our premiums gets injured or a center wing goes down. And then you can easily flip him back to some kind of center wing that's playable. Uh, not that Ezra Mam's ever been, you know, relevant. But if he does, you know, flicker the switch, then pretty handy there. Luke Brooks has a really nice matchup in round seven moving forward. Titans. Um, into Parramatta, into the Raiders, into the Dolphins. So Luke Brooks could be a guy you pick up if you're sick of Taylor May and he hasn't really performed. And, you know, Taylor May out, moving down to uh, move Ethan Strange down, bringing in Brooks, for example, or, you know, uh, one of these other guys with decent rate. The Sharks, you know, Braden Trindle, if he, for whatever reason, finds form over the next couple of weeks. The Panthers, Luai's always been there or thereabouts with these 5'8 considerations. I think this year, Matty, 5'8 is a position to take a bit of a chance on because it's the lowest scoring position in terms of... So each week I do the team of the season. I update that every week. 
And 5'8 is actually the lowest position. So currently the best 5'8 in the game is Tom Dearden, who's only averaging a 63. The next lowest position in the team is front and forward, where Adam Fenwell Blake's averaging 68. So I think you can take risks at 5'8 here. I think 5'8 this year is a, is a chance to take some risks and go for some upside. Yeah, and I suppose that's what I was kind of doing with the with the Metcalf situation. But maybe you just roll the dice on somebody spicy. Like, I thought Tom Dearden was spicy at the start of the year. And um, those people are laughing. Even though you're not that impressed with a 63, um, they're doing a lot better than everybody else. So, 100%. Um, 100%. And Lockie Galvin, I think he's a very fine play. But yeah, but the problem is, like we just said, that draw, it's not not fun to walk back into. I'm not playing him against Panthers ever. No, and I'd probably rather play Strange against the Broncos. But, you know, in a perfect world, the beauty of Strange is we can move him down to center wing and bring in one of these other guys. We've just mentioned a couple of them that have good draws. Lua has a nice draw. The Warriors have have a nice draw. Manly have a nice draw. Um, Hell, even the Knights, you know, they have an okay run of fixtures as well. And I know people might be sitting there laughing at those suggestions, like a, a Tyson Gamble or a Jack Cogger or someone like that. But realistically, 5 8 isn't presenting anything to us. And I'd yep. happily take a punt at that position. Yep. Um, Zane Beard here. Um, a very similar question. He's looking to sell Dill Brown um, and move Strange up to 5 8 for a premium center wing. Uh, what do you think of selling um, Dylan Brown this week? I can see it. I can understand it. Um, at the start of the year, we said he was set and forget. Don't touch him. Don't move off him. But. It wasn't until last week that we finally saw a little bit of involvement. He was a bee's dick away from getting three or four line breaks. So on another day, he ends up with 90 points. But we've been saying that now for four weeks. Um, I think teams pay a lot of attention to him now that Moses is out because he is the focal point. I can understand it. It's probably the moving week for him. I think now is the decision that you make, whether you jump off um, or just ride it out. Because him being a Kiwi, you're happy just to cop some 50s until Origin. And as we said, you're going to lose bulk money on him, but Really, a 55 points from Dylan Brown is not that bad when Tom Dearden is excelling with a 63. So yep. I can understand the sell. Definitely moving Strange up. We've just seen he's got two good matchups while Galvin is out. Uh, and then, you know, reassessing and bringing in a cheaper 5 8 if someone does present themselves. Uh, and center wing, we know the upside that they have. And, you know, a Val, a Dom Young, a Manu, these guys have much bigger ceilings than Dylan Brown. Um, and Dill Brown's floor is not what we thought it was. We always said that even on a bad day, he'll get a 60, but that's not happening. So I can really get behind this. Um, the next one, oh, and I'm happy to grab it, even though I don't really know the answer to it. Uh, Melmo's asking, other than Terrell May, who is the next best front row forward to target? Um, if I turn around and say uh, your guess is as good as mine, but I still think it is like a Max King or a Ruben Cotter or somebody along those lines, probably a Max King over a Ruben Cotter with, with origin looming. Like, oh, I it's, don't really love Adam Fanil Blake. No, um, no, nor do I. I don't love Flegler with the, with origin. I think it's a, I think the best option is someone that isn't a front row forward right now. I think it's Josh Curran. I think it is. I think if you have Josh Curran, just, just hold it out. Like, I'm holding down the fort this week with Liam Henry. I don't think it's going to be a great play with James Fisher-Harris back. But if it's one more week, I'd be very happy to move Josh Curran up there. Um, if you're still someone like me who owns a Spencer Lenu, you have a really nice 70 break even Angus Crichton there to buy next week for 380k to shift Lenu down and move Curran up. That could be a great get-out-of-jail-free card there. So I wouldn't be making rash trade. And that's why I, people have asked me why am I still running Liam Henry. Because nothing else has really presented itself at, fi- at front and forward. Like, yeah, Flegler has been cool. He's now getting a touch more expensive than what I want to pay. And he's also heading to Origin in, you know, two months. I don't really want to be making multiple trades. May, Curran, if I can get those two up there, then amazing. No, I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there with Liam Henry as well. And you have a look at the top five and you've got Fanua Blake, who's done it with attacking stats. Don't love that in front row forward. You've got Terrell May. You've got Jack DeBallon. Um, and yeah, I don't know what's going on with the forward rotation in the Dragons. There's too many question marks for me. Uh, you've got Joey Taps, uh, which if you can get him on a run, um, fantastically, he's been playing 60, uh, 60 minutes this season. Um, and you've got yeah Max King there in the in the top five. So yeah, probably picking somebody out like that. But I just don't see anyone I want to shell out five hundred and fifty k upwards 
Um, like if you go into the top 10, there's nobody except for Tom Hazelton, uh, which I'm never touching, uh, below 500K. So, yeah. No, I think it's Max King if Josh Kahn doesn't get Jewel, but I'd rather just wait until next week till we get confirmation. Um, I've lumped together a couple of front row forward questions, and Mr. Callio is back again asking if Sam Hughes is a playable option this week, or would you prefer playing somebody like Strange or Burbo? Um, I think Strange is probably the play out of these guys. As much as it's funny that Sam Hughes has been named to start, like I don't have high expectations. Um, Poasa Farmasuli played F all minutes. Liam Knight played no minutes last week when he started as well. And and Hughes hasn't been building up. It's not like he's gone 15, 20, 25, 30. Like he's slowly building his motor. His minutes have been terrible. They've been getting worse. So I don't have huge expectations for, for Sam Hughes. Um, so I'd rather just take a 25-point floor from Ethan Strange with the potential of being 60, 70 points in upside. No, I'm with you there. Um, and I haven't been impressed with Burbo in the last couple of weeks. His role seems to be diminishing. Um, Perp is asking, how do you think the Knights attack will be affected uh, with the scouts that was Tyson Gamble getting booted uh, for a couple of genuine um, halfbacks, I suppose, in Cogger and Hastings? Uh, does this make Kalen more appealing? Yeah, it's tough because the only time that we saw Cogger and Hastings together was in round one when they looked putrid, but that was also with Gamble on the field and Crosland. They had like five ball players at once and they're now dropping back to three um, with Braley starting. So I think having two legitimate playmakers could definitely open up uh, KP and give him a bit more structure. But for me, it's, I'm just more concerned about this weather. And I know people like maybe look into this, like crystals or a bit of hoo-hoo, like whatever, but like, it's just true. Like, the, the Knights take on the Dragons at McDonald Jones with a 70% chance of rain, 37 kilometer hour winds, which is not fun, uh, especially if it's going to be wet weather, right windy as well. You don't really want to be shifting balls too much. It might be a game just straight down the the old hey diddle diddle. But KP, I don't think he can get, he can get worse with having two legitimate playmakers in the, in the side either. And two legitimate playmakers that don't sit wide either. They like to collect the ball quite narrow and give KP space. Um, and I did read the rest of the question. It was more Kalo, uh, Kalen against a Gutho. Um, so is there an argument for Gutho this week over Kalen? Sorry, I just had the biggest sneeze. Um, yeah, I think long-term you want KP. Like, I think just that draw is so good. And if you can hold off making just a, a, a pointless trade, just to, to just get another week. Um, Gutho... He, we know what he does. He averages nearly 100 points with no Moses. But I haven't... I put those numbers together, but I haven't been able to go back and look at who he played against to get those numbers. Um, I just know that it's a sample. Like, he could have played bottom feeders for all I know. I just didn't look at the fixtures. But KP, stud, both goal kicking. This week, I'd play play KP over Gutho. Um, but long term, I'd probably also take KP. So there's my answer. Um, skipping over another fullback question, because I think for, for Tross, uh, we did answer if he's replacing to a picky, um, already has turbo and he's got enough money for Ponga. Um, who should he pick? Um, I'm probably going Ponga and by the sounds of it, you'd probably go a Gutho. So, oh, sorry, not uh, a Gutho. No, no, I'd go, I'd go Ponga as well. You go Ponga as well. Excellent. Yeah. That makes that one easy. Um, it's just, Lenny, it's just with, um, like, if we're looking at pure points and money means nothing to you, um, KP, but you know, it's nearly what 150k price difference. Like that's a lot of money. Um, yep. if money was tight, then yeah, Gutho is absolutely fine. Um, Lenny, um, well, last plan for the strikers, I think down there in the BBL, um, thoughts on Fletcher Baker now with Xavier Willison out. <laughs> Um, Fletcher Baker banged out of 55 last week. That was definitely his best game as a Bronco. Um, what do you think, mate? Yeah, I mean, we all pegged him to be like this this cheapy front row forward maestro at the start of the season, had the, the injury in a limited preseason. Minutes have been okay. Played 70 minutes last week, but that was heavily, heavily inflated. Um, and only scored a 49 in 70 minutes, scored a 55 this week. I don't know. Plays Melbourne this week. It's never fun to play Melbourne, even if you are a front row forward. Um, minutes are all over the shop for Kevy. Corey Jensen, people bought him to be some kind of like good option. But we said this when we analyzed Flagler. Like, even Flagler, the Broncos, was never crash hot. 
you're now paying 360k for Baker, which is yep. more than the 310 you were paying for him th- two weeks ago. Break even of two, so you make a little bit of cash. I don't think it's enough to jump on because you'll have to trade him out in what three weeks time when Haas is back. Yeah, when Haas comes oh. back, that's the question mark. You're going to get a you couple might, of good. You might make 70, you might make 70k for two trades. Oh. Oh, I'm not saying it. Not in front row forward. Like, um, if we can probably say anything in both of us, and I hope you don't mind me speaking for you, we're trying not to waste these trades in front row forward when there's no real massive upside. So. That's exactly why I've just held Henry. Like when 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 Lenny was suspended, I was just like, unless I can get to a Tina or a Haas, I'm just like, well, let's just wait. And then obviously we have got blessed with current. Like there's been rumors circulating for a little bit, so. Um, yeah, I'm very happy just to, to wait and get an idea on Curran. If Curran doesn't materialize, then, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> yes, um, I'm probably hoping that that doesn't materialize because I am probably the one guy I know that doesn't have Curran and, um, yeah, not seeing the upside in second row, uh, but we love him in front row. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Two questions to go, and I'm going to answer one from Hanko, and it was a little bit too long. Um, I'm going to answer it in its, uh, ask it in its entirety, um, and let you explain break evens uh, to Hanko. So it is a break even question. Um, he has Galvin and Plath, um, unlucky, um, but Galvin's break even for round five is minus forty six, and Hanko's sort of saying in round six, then it'll be zero. And then when he returns in round seven, round seven he'll have a break even of twenty nine. Um, he's asking, does this mean Galvin's best cash cow opportunity is gone as he's missed his lowest break even opportunities, or does break evens adjust if suspended? Um, so, give us a bit of a chat about how break evens work, mate. Yeah, so we're looking at the super coach projections on the gold where it says he's uh, break evens all over the shop. The reason that says it's all over the shop is because they're projecting him to score zero. That's why it changes. Now, he will get a DNP. His rolling average won't change. So what a break-even is, it's a three-round rolling average subjective to your price. So if a 650K center wing goes 70, 70, 70, they'll have a low break-even, a lower than their price break-even. But they won't make as much money as a bottom dollar cheaper that goes 70, 70, 70 because it's a differential between the price and the projection output. Now, Lockie Galvin still has a minus 47 break even. He could be out for one week, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. His break even will always be minus 46. It's not changing. He will be come back into the side in two weeks' time and his break even will be minus 46. It won't change because he's out. It only changes when they take the field. So don't look at the Supercoach Gold projections when it comes to a player who's outs break even. His money-making opportunity hasn't changed. It won't change. It's always great. Um, it will be minus 46 when he comes back. But in essence, a break even is a score a player must reach in order to maintain their price. Anything over that, that will go up in price. I think the magic number is about $840. So for every, if one player's break even is zero and they score 100, it's roughly about 84 grand that they'll make in profit. Roughly. No, nope. uh, love it there. Um, yeah, look, yeah, basically hold on to Galvin. Don't be, um, yeah, don't be worried. Yeah. Basically, you're going to have to move on one of those guys perhaps because that's two weeks without a 5-8 though. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah, but I wouldn't be moving on Galvin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. That's, that's where I was heading. Uh, Edge uh, has probably the best question of the round, um, and this is our last question tonight. Um, it's a three-part question. Um our current best guess at the top two fullbacks over round five to 12, which is up until origin rounds 13 to 19, which is during origin and then 20 to 26, which is post origin. Um, let's start at five to 12 and um, rattle off who we think has the best draws through there. So if we're looking at total points, it's going to be a little bit different to, to averages because total points will favor guys that don't have buys guys that you can see at the top of the screen here that are, what are they? Probably the the Panthers and up. Or oh, sorry, the Sharks and up. They're the teams that would have the most points. So your Will Kendis, your Hamisos, they'll have the most mm-hmm. points because they have least buys. But if we're looking at averages, I think Scott Drinkwater has to be in, in with a shout. I think KP takes the takes the mantelpiece as the best fullback to have from round 6 to 12. Looking at that draw, we can see the Knights draw there is pretty immaculate. Does have the buy in round 12, which is the only negative on his total point scoring. Still think he has the best average over that time. Broncos. 
Reese Walsh, I think he is there. People, the reason why this question is so hard is because there is many factors into it. There's price, there's break even, there's money making potential, there's captaincy options. If we're getting rid of all those things, we don't care about those. We're looking solely at averages. I think it's KP. I think it's Reese Walsh. I think it's Tom Travojevic, and I think it's Scott Drinkwater, um, in probably that order. Um, and then you know, Pappy is there or thereabouts. He has a really good nice draw as well. I don't think you can go wrong with any five of those guys, and that's probably not the answer that you wanted to hear. But I think those guys are so elite that you're not going to be. Like, they're, they're not miles better than each other. Probably favor the guys that goal kick, favor the um, the pongers of the world, because just he has that you know, much better floor. But I don't think you can go wrong. If I had to rank them in terms of averages, it would be KP, Walsh, Paps, Drinkwater, Turbo. And I'm just going to add one more into the mix. I think um, Deadwoods, Dylan Edwards is is a guy that you could play as well. I know that round six buy is scary, uh, but apart from that, when you have a look at the Tigers into the Cowboys, into Souths, into the Bulldogs, into New Zealand, as you see, is the only red one. Um, and we've sort of pointed out that they've been leaking a lot of points to fullbacks at the moment into the Sharks, which haven't been playing their best footy. Um, I know it's a lot of money to, sh- I suppose, shell out for a meat and potatoes fullback. Uh, but you know what? If you've got that much chaos with a K in your team, uh, you could probably just um, just add a Dylan Edwards and just sit there on that. Correct. The only reason I'm not saying Gutho is just it's just not great. It's it's by Broncos Melbourne. That's the only three week yeah. slight on his name. Moving to the second part of this question, round twelve to round twenty or round thirteen to round twenty. And this is where it really opens up because uh, there is no right or wrong answer here. As you can see, a lot of yeah. people are on buys. A lot of people are going to be away for origin. And he's not a guy that I'd ever look at, but Jareem Buller has a pretty clean run with some nice green fixtures in there. But I just don't think he's up to the elite standard that the other guys are. The Roosters have a really nice origin period, but the problem is Tedesco is going to miss 13, 14, 16, and 19, and then backing up in 20 against Melbourne away. So the fixtures look great on paper, which is why we suggested Joey Manu beforehand as well. It's really tough with these guys because you look at someone like a Chancellor or Klukstar who will be floating there or thereabouts, but he also misses 66% of the major buys. He'll be out in 13 and 19, which is not ideal. Fullback this time of year is not really going to be fun um, at all. The Storm have an okay draw, but Pappy's going to miss 13 and 19 as well. Rule of thumb. You want your origin guys to be on teams that have major buyers outages because they're going to miss those games anyway, and you'd rather them miss them on the buys. So a team like, goodness, I'm trying to find a team, a team like someone like Appy Coruscant, awful buy structure for him because the Tigers miss round 13, he's going to miss round 16, and he's going to miss round 19 as well. So he's going to have a really crappy buy structure, um, but someone like a Harry Grant has got a good buy structure because he was already missing round 13. He was already missing round 19. He's only going to miss one extra game, whereas Appy's going to miss two. So that's just the way that I look at it. But fullback, Matty, at this time of year, mate, there's no one that really stands out. No, and I probably start to look um, look maybe these these center wing eligible guys uh, yep. could be the guys to carry the weight. Um, like Even Jordan Rapana, like if you see the Dolphins into the Cowboys, into the Tigers um, with a you know good buy schedule there, um, but yeah, Joey Manu is probably one I'm going to be targeting through that period. I can see the it reason already, why so. guys like Manu are so attractive, not only in person but also for Super Coach, oh, he is. is is because if you do make a fullback transfer, you bring Manu in. He's a guy that you can then just trade the center wing out for for a fullback because he's a keeper at the back end of the season. So it's just a killing two birds with one stone type of thing. You get Origin cover, but you also get a season keeper in an alternate position. So that's why Manu was always there or thereabouts during Origin. It's why AJ is sometimes popular during this period of the year as well. He sometimes picks up fullback Jewel um, because he's a, a keeper, guys, that you play based off matchups at the back end of the season. Third part of this question, the run home, the most probably important part of the season for head-to-head players and classic players trying to make that late push to get there. What are we thinking about 21 to 27? And for me, I'm looking at these back-end matchups, trying to pick out who's got the best, who's got the worst. Dylan Edwards pops up in 25, 26, 27. Some nice matchups for him. Does have an icky fixture in 24 against Melbourne. But pretty smooth sailing apart from that. Um, Eyeing off the rest of the guys. KP, buy in round 21. 
Penrith away in 22. He could be a great pickup in round 24, uh, round 23. Tigers at home, Sharks away, Souths away, Titans at home, Dolphins at home. If the Knights find that form that they had last year, Matty, KP is probably going to be bordering a must-have with that draw. Yeah. Um, look, I love KP. I'm sitting there with him. Um, if you don't own him, he's going to become must-own in round 23. Regardless, he could be a million dollars. He could. You're still just going to have to find money for him. Um, but I don't want to keep throwing, um, you know, little favoritism out there. But have a look at Reese Walsh sitting. There. Yeah, like if up, you, if you can apart cover from for, that round twenty-seven, round twenty-seven and round twenty-five, uh, if you can cover for those, and amazing. Um, look, if you can cover for the twenty-three buy for Tedesco, he's also got a really nice run. Manly home, Dolphins away, buy Parramatta at home, Titans away, Raiders at home. Souths away in a grudge match to end the season. There's more options here. So for me, it's going to be looking at Reese Walsh, Kalen Ponga, Dylan Edwards, and probably James Tedesco for mine. Yep. No, I'm agreeing with you there. Uh, you're definitely going to want to have got rid of your, your Hamisos and everything like that because um, their season looks dreadful there. I'm actually already thinking of when I'm going to get rid of Hamiso um, as an owner since day one. So, um, And I don't think I'll see him back in my lineup this year uh, with Origin coming up and with a terrible end to the season schedule-wise. And, um, yeah, if the Dolphins taught us anything last year, it uh, could be a terrible end of the season for... Uh, for them but that wraps up all the questions mate um mate that was, that was a good q a thanks for coming on with me no nah, all good mate always happy to jump on always happy. um no sounds good um good luck to everybody in this round uh we will be back on sunday um but yeah you've listened to an insight fantasy sports podcast cheerio